Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Women and Gender Studies Institute Research Seminar at the University of Toronto. Um, the event today is Feminist Generations, a conversation with Selma James, Margaret Prescott, and Chanda Prescott Weinstein. Uh, let me begin with an acknowledgement of the land. Carrie, you're on mute. Forgive me, everyone. Let me start this one more time. Um, a very, very warm welcome to all of you uh, to the first Women and Gender Studies Research Institute uh, um, uh, seminar uh, for 2022, Feminist Generations, a conversation with Selma James, Margaret Prescott, and Chanda Prescott Weinstein. Uh, let me begin with uh, an acknowledgement of the sacred land on which the University of Toronto stands and on which it operates. Uh, uh, we work on Indigenous lands and on the shores of the planet's largest gathering of fresh water. For thousands of years, it's been the home of Indigenous peoples, the Huron Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and most recently, uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit uh, First Nation. Today, the meeting place of Takaranta remains the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are immensely grateful to have the opportunity to work here uh, and to enter into respectful and caring relations. Uh, so welcome again. I am Carrie Riddick. And along with my friend and colleague, uh, Alyssa Trotz, and in fact, all of my colleagues at the Women and Gender Studies Institute, uh, we'd like to and extend a very, very warm welcome, uh, uh, especially to the many, many people who are joining us from all around the world today. Uh, um, uh, we are convening a conversation among three absolutely extraordinary people, uh, Selma James, uh, Margaret Prescott, and Chanda Prescott Weinstein, who uh, both together and separately and in distinct and overlapping ways have made uh, uh, crucial uh, uh, um, interventions in uh, um, a number of fields. They've made um, groundbreaking uh, um, uh, forms of work and activism in transnational feminist, anti-colonial, anti-racist, and of course, anti-capitalist politics. Uh, I wanna just flag their particularly important contributions to work through their uh, um, crucial organizing roles in uh, uh, networks such as Wages for Housework, uh, in uh, Margaret's case, Black Women for Wages for Housework, and of course, the Global Women's Strike. Uh, we now have a vastly expanded and deepened understanding of unpaid house and care work, its distribution and devaluation along racial as well as gender lines, its links to the organization of paid work in capitalist economies, and of course, its connections to broader questions of uh, political economy and decolonization. Uh, as if this were not enough, and it's more than enough, the relationships among them, both familial and political, uh, uh, we think gives us a remarkable, and we now know, unprecedented opportunity to think about what connects, what organizes, and what sustains activist engagement over time. Uh, what linkages and, of course, what roadblocks uh, uh, might exist between practical and intellectual work, the academy and the community, um, but above all, how to think collectively and how to think over time about the possibilities and the perils along the paths forward as we confront new challenges, uh, for example, ecological sustainability, even as all of the old ones continue. Okay, their past work is already well known and cherished by many of us, but I want to just say that as I discovered when read, reading Chanda's recently released book, The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time, and Dreams Deferred, there remain absolutely remarkable frontiers uh, to explore and still more ways to approach these questions. Uh, so like our audience, our speakers today are joining us from different locales in the globe. Selma is in London, uh, Margaret is in Los Angeles, and I believe, Chanda, correct me if I'm wrong, that you are in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
Um, uh, um, and uh, we'd just like to thank you immensely from the bottom of our hearts for your time, your work, and your willingness to share some thoughts about uh, the intersections between your work and your lives today. Before I hand it over to Alyssa uh, to give a truly proper introduction to, to all of our speakers, let me just briefly outline the plan for the rest of today. Uh, we'll begin with introductory remarks from Selma, uh, from Margaret, and from Chanda. Uh, then Alyssa and I have devised a number of questions that we'd like to pose uh, uh, to all of them, um, uh, and which we are confident will provoke a conversation among them. And for the remaining time, we'd very much like to hear from you. So we would invite you to put any specific questions, uh, either to all of the speakers or, or to uh, specific speakers, uh, speakers into the Q&A, um, which we will monitor. And we uh, uh, promise to take up at least some of them uh, at the very end of the session. And we will plan to wrap up by about uh, um, 4.45 Toronto time, Eastern Standard Time, uh, in part because it's already nighttime for Selma. Um, Alyssa, over to you. Thank you, Kerry. And I, I, I'm really so delighted to be here with this remarkable trio Chanda, who's actually in the New Hampshire seacoast, to meet Chanda for the first time, and to be with Margaret and Selma, whom I've known and worked with for years, and we're connected forever through my late mentor and I. Um, this is incredible. The three of you have never actually been in public conversation before, which is remarkable to us so thank you and you know we weren't sure if this was going to happen until Selma was like well I would be curious to know what this conversation would look like and Chanda was like okay fine let's do it so here we are with over 400 of you we're so excited most of you are actually not in universities or academia when we looked at the list so it's a really diverse set of folks from a variety of institutional sites we're getting all of this love in the chat and on the Q&A folks who have just written a chapter on Margaret's work, please put your comments here. Even if we don't get to all of the questions, Selma, Margaret and Chanda very much want to see all of them and all of this love that you're sharing with them. We will download all of that and send that to them um, along with a list of all of your names. So thank you so much. And, and Selma has been with us before at the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. I believe it was about in 2012. And of course, Wages for Housework has had a history in Canada. One of those persons is, you know, wonderful colleague Benita Lawrence up at York University, who it seems shows up for almost everything Selma speaks at and is here today. Thank you so much, Benita. I found today uh, an essay you wrote called Homeworking for Next to Nothing in an early, I think, 1970s edition of the Falling Wall Review, The Social Factory. So those Canadian connections are really present here. So thanks, Benita, for being here. I'm just going to introduce Selma, um, Margaret, and then Chanda, and then we will go immediately to each of them speaking for 10 minutes, locating themselves in their political um, and, and intellectual work before we open up to questions. So Selma James is an anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-capitalist campaigner. She was born in Brooklyn in 1930. I believe in August of this year, Selma will be celebrating her 92nd birthday. She was raised in a movement household, uh, joining CLR James's Johnson Forest tendency at 15 and emigrating to London with her son, Sam Weinstein, to join CLR after he was deported from the US during McCarthyism. Selma worked with CLR in the movement for federation and regional sovereignty in the Anglophone Caribbean between 1958 and 1962. So for Caribbeanists, Selma is really important on all kinds of grounds. Once back in London, she was the first organizing secretary of the Campaign Against Racial Discrimination. In 1972, she founded the International Wages for Housework Campaign and launched a global women's strike in 2000, which the Wages for Housework coordinates. Most recently, Selma coordinates the Care Income Now campaign that was launched alongside the Green New Deal for Europe in 2020. She co-authored the classic power of women and the subversion of community, which is widely understood to have launched the domestic labor debate. Selma also coined the word on wage to account for and count 
the caring work that is largely done by women on our planet. Salma is also a founding member of the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network. She has edited, authored, and co-authored several publications, including the one I think she would say is her favorite, Ujama, The Hidden Story of Tanzania's Socialist Villages, Sex, Race, and Class, The Perspective of Winning, and just a few months ago, and the, the cover is up here with an, an amazing introduction by Margaret, the aptly titled, Our Time is Now, Sex, Race, Class, and Caring for People and Planet. And yes, folks, this was published when Selma was 91 years old. Hailing from Barbados and based in Los Angeles, Margaret Prescott is the co-founder with Wilmette Brown of Black Women for Wages for Housework, more than four and a half decades ago and still going strong and is a coordinator of women of color in the global women's strike. Margaret is the author of Black Women Bringing It All Back Home and is an award-winning nationally syndicated journalist on Pacifica Radio, perhaps best known in this regard for her incredible program, Sojourner Truth, which she is host and executive producer of. Margaret founded the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders in the 1980s. I believe there's an award-winning film on HBO about this, if folks wanted to find out some more about that. And she is co-founder of Every Mother is a Working Mother Network. Margaret has been actively engaged in the ongoing struggle for justice and liberation for Haiti. This is a central part of what she does and how she understands herself, organizing as part of the Haiti Working Group of the Global Women's Strike. And Chanda Prescott Weinstein is the daughter of Margaret Prescott and the granddaughter of Selma James, an assistant professor of physics and astronomy and core faculty in women and gender studies at the University of New Hampshire. Chanda actually was an undergraduate student at the University of Waterloo and just recently received the University of Waterloo Faculty of Science Distinguished Alumni Award for 2021. I believe Chanda is probably the youngest person to receive that award. Her scientific research focuses on particles and cosmology. Chanda also conducts research in Black feminist science, technology, and society studies, and is the author of the incredible, I read it, the cover is just absolutely stunning and a tribute to Black folks everywhere the author of The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time, and Dreams Deferred. It's a fierce and loving invitation to collectively assemble a more liberatory science practice. Chanda is also a columnist for this new scientist and physics world and is winner of the 2021 Edward A. Boucher Award from the American Physical Society. That's more than enough from Kerry and myself. We will open with Salma, move to Chand uh, Margaret, and, and then Chanda. So Salma, over to you. Thank you so much, and what a generous introduction to us all. Uh, I have to begin my story with the 1930s, because that's the year I was born, and I think it was the one. I think it's one of the most extraordinary decades, certainly that I have lived through. In 1917, there was a revolution which women began. In, in, in creating the Soviet Union, whatever happened to it afterwards, it was the work of millions of people that changed the world and changed the whole world. We were aware that in some country in the world, the working class was in charge and it changed our lives. In um, 1918, there were many changes, also the war was over. And in 1929, another war in a way was begun because the economy fell apart. And 1930, I made my entrance into the world that was created by these events. Um, there were many things that happened in that decade. It was a decade of working class struggle, the first sit-ins in 36, a revolution in Spain, a struggle against racism, um, the struggle against the struggle for the men who were accused, the black men who were accused of rape and whom after a great um, campaign, we won. Um, the Scottsboro boys shall not die. I remember it, I was about three or four and learned those words. I'm not sure I understood what they meant. 
but that was my background and part of, an, of a community of people who were involved in the movement, in the anti-capitalist movement, in the working class movement, in the anti-racist movement. And in a way, even though it was not mentioned, it was a women's movement too. Women wore trousers for the first time among other things. But we made our, our feelings and our understandings felt there. And uh, it was a great education for me uh, to be part of that movement. And the concepts that I learned there, I have used all my life. They've been the framework of my mind. My father was involved in building a trade union, in fact, um, at which the whole family, of course, was in some way involved in, even me. Um, in 1945, after the war, after the bomb had dropped and it was advertised on my 15th birthday and I understood that the world had changed, I knew that I wanted to be part of an organization of socialists and I didn't know where to go. So I went to a couple of organizations on spec, so to speak, and I finally decided to be part of the youth group of a Trotskyist organization, which my older sister was part of. And I soon found myself in a minority, which was led by CLR James. I was very interested in what he had to say. I didn't understand a lot of it, but I understood he intended to win. And that was enough for me to be going on with. I remember in those days, there were a couple of things that stood out in my mind. One of them was a class on black history where I heard about the dialectic for the first time. And he told my sister that my eyes lit up when he mentioned the dialectic and they still light up for the dialectic. <laughs> I understood, <laughs> what can I do? I understood a lot about how to view politics and how to view history from that one session that I intended. But as I became more involved um, in what was called the Johnson Forest tendencies, I understood most importantly that what James was proposing was another kind of organization from what the left was, which was based on what he called the third layer. That is those of us in the society who don't have any kind of purchase on power, who are, you know, most of the world, most of the world in every country. And he tried to build an organization that was based on the feelings, impulses, and deep ideas of the people who are at the grassroots. Um, at some point he asked me, because I was working on, he asked me to write a book, of, to write a pamphlet about women. I told him I hadn't done it because I didn't know how to write a pamphlet. And he said, it's very simple. You just put some, Every sentence you think about, you put it in a shoebox, and one day you open the shoebox and put the sentences together. Well, I did that, and A Woman's Place was the result, which is still being published today. But the experience of trying to build an organization when it, with, based on the grassroots when the whole of society was against it, when the whole of society was trying to create a hierarchy among us because that was the way capital was structured was a big experience for me. Uh, we got together, he and I, in various ways. And when he had to leave the US, he was never quite deported. He left before he was deported, went back to England where he had been for some years. When he left, uh, I tried to join him. And in a year or a year and a half, 
with my young son, Sam, I did. And we um, were, an um, uh, were very important to each other, not only personally, but I became his secretary. And I learned a lot doing that work. Um, I typed his books and that time without, um, without computers, it was a lot of work. You had to type and retype and retype. In 58, he was um, asked to come to the, go back to Trinidad and work with the new federation and asked if what I thought about going and I said, sure, and we all went. And I had the five years in the West Indies learning a lot about governments, how attractive they are to all kinds of ambitious people, and even who are not ambitious, becoming ambitious when they see the possibilities of power as it is associated with government. And I saw how governments work because I was very closely not doing the work of government, but watching what CLR was doing. Um, and learned from that, helped him to put it out the newspaper, worked on the newspaper, helped publish the first book that was ever published in Trinidad called Party Politics in the West Indies. The Federation failed, and that was a big experience for me too. Um, I went to, uh, back to England, we, we, the family returned to England and shortly uh, and I was involved in the anti-deportation and anti-racist movement uh, until the women's movement burst out and I felt that I wanted to be involved in that as well, as well as anti-racism. I couldn't uh, separate the two in my mind and in fact. And by 1972, I decided that we had to find out what was women's specific relation to capital. And I thought it's the fact that we reproduce the whole working class. And in fact, we reproduce everybody in the society and we are not given any wage for it. And that demanding wages was a way of having an international movement because this was a situation of women internationally. And it meant that we no longer were the, the subsidiary of men and we're no longer dependent on them financially as we often were. Even if we worked outside the home, we got much less than they did. And we were still dependent on a man's paycheck, which opened the way to all kinds of brutality, which women, we know about this, and it still goes on, which women had suffered, always trying to make sure that our children's needs were met. That was our contribution. And it was a very anti-capitalist, and I might add, very anti-racist action and concern. Um, it was the beginning. It was that that really brought me together with Margaret Prescott, because in 1975, the Wages for Housework campaign had an international conference on the basis also of something I'd written called Sex, Race and Class, talking about the autonomy of black women and their right to decide with or without men and in what way, et cetera. That was a statement about autonomy. Margaret found that useful. And so did another woman, Wilmet Brown, and the two of them came to England and we met and we have never parted in crucial ways since then. They were extraordinary women and Margaret has been an extraordinary um, spokeswoman for the campaign, for the whole campaign. Um, our relationship 
is based on the fact that we are both trying to do the same thing in different places and often in different ways. Um, and when she married my son, Sam, it meant that we were also family so that Chanda, when she was born, was my granddaughter and the work continued. It was always the work that brought us together because it wasn't a job like any other. It was your life's work that you were trying to build an international movement, which meant you had to be anti-racist, not only anti-sexist, and that every sector of the working class uh, was, uh, was, a, a, was going to make up a movement of that kind. We had redefined the work that women did as work for capital, and therefore we redefined the working class. It was not that few white men with a few men of color in the metropolis. It was all of us in the whole world, on the land, in the home, and as well as in the factory and the office and the hospital um, that made up this force, which we felt had, would come together, had to come together, and we would help to build that movement. And that's what we've been doing ever since. Thank you so much, Selma. Um, I'm gonna go straight to Margaret. Wow, Selma, that, that was fantastic. You covered so much in the time that you have. Really appreciate that. And um, speaking a little bit about myself, I'm an immigrant uh, to the United States from Barbados. I know that there are a lot of Bajans uh, up in Canada. A lot of us Bajans tend to go a lot to the quote unquote mother country, uh, the UK, also to the United States as well as to, to Canada. So I was born and raised there. I'm, I'm in a village. I grew up in La Jolla Christ Church for any people who hail from Barbados who happen to be listening, which in those days was considered a small village. I wasn't from town. And even in an island as small as Barbados, 14 by 21 miles, there was an urban rural divide. And there were also village to village uh, divisions. There were those of us who are considered up country like my grandparents and like my aunties um, who were where my father uh, was born and raised, the Prescott clan, so to speak, from Brereton's village in St. Philip, any people from St. Philip uh, in the audience, versus those of us in the villages from Christ Church, who for some reason were not considered upcountry. So you go and figure that. And of course, there were also racial divisions. It was the old plantocracy, which was still in place when I, I grew up, for example, in a house that was, is referred to as a chattel house. I really didn't make the connection, if you would believe this, with chattel slavery until I was grown. And um, our village was in an old slave quarters down the hill from the plantation house closest uh, to us, which was in Newton in Christ Church. Turns out it was relatively recently discovered that the area of Newton has the largest known slave cemetery found to date in the entire Western hemisphere. The slavery of Barbados, very, very brutal over uh, 650,000 uh, souls. Um, the slavery in Barbados was so brutal that they imported the slavers to the Carolina coast to train them in how to torture slaves. Our island was flat. There were no mountains. We had nowhere to run but into the sea. And Barbados produced enormous wealth for England and also universities in the United States like Harvard, William and Mary, uh, Yale, um, Brown, Rutgers, and many others really got their a huge boost with money coming out of Barbados. And, in, and indeed Barbados was considered the uh, society, the first society that was entirely based on slavery. There was nothing else going on and it was there where they worked it out and then exported it 
um, around the world. So I grew up basically right next to this largest slave cemetery, except we didn't know about it growing up. And to my sorrow and the sorrow of my siblings, we were afraid and mortified that we were uh, what we would call gallivanting or playing around on what we know now is sacred uh, ground. Even within um, the churches were segregated. The Church of England, the Anglican Church in which I was raised, um, was segregated when I was young. The white people tended to go to the seven o'clock service in the morning. Um, us darkies went to the, the later service. And even in the later service, the uh, service, the few white people who showed up, they would sit in the front rows and the rest of us uh, sat in the back. Now, of course, since our independence um, in, in 1976, a lot of this has changed. And now people are sitting in church wherever the damn well please. And as of November of uh, last year, of this year, yeah, this is 2022 of last year, 2021, when Barbados ditched the queen and established ourselves as a republic. Who knows what next with our newfound sense of self and independence, we may very well demand. Well, reparations being one. I would also say, um, Selma and others, that my first political act in thinking about this presentation I actually thought I did it when I was four years old. Let me explain what that is. My grandmother, who had lived in the United States since my mother was three years old, came for a long visit of several months to Barbados and brought with her my American-born cousin, John Barton, who was close to my age. Apparently, the hope was that he and I would bond so closely and thus I would be convinced to leave my immediate family and go with my grandmother and cousin to the US for what they described as a better life. I refused and ran out of the house. There was no way I was going to leave my mother, father, sister, brother, no matter how much big house they said I would live in or how many pretty, pretty dresses I would have. Um, I preferred to live close to uh, relative poverty to the riches of the United States and to be torn apart from my family and the work that I'm doing now in uh, child welfare with so many children being taken and uh, put up for adoption and in foster care, torn from their families. I'm very much reminded of that. Uh, but I didn't think about that as a political act, but I'm thinking that it actually was. I eventually lost that battle because my mother with my two siblings, my brother, who's a Vietnam vet, and my sister, Roz, emigrated um, to New York City. And when we arrived in New York City, we only realized at, upon arrival that our housing had fallen through. And so we were divided. My brother and my mother went to live in Queens with my grandmother and an aunt. And my sister and I went to live in Brooklyn with another aunt. And as hard as that was, as luck would have it, my Aunt Mel, that my sister and I lived with in Brooklyn, was a school teacher at Public School 161 in Brooklyn and an activist in Brooklyn Corps. Turned out her father was a Garveyite. She had a different father than, than my mom. She was Aunt Mel, who's now deceased, was recently honored by one of her former students when he was inaugurated as the new superintendent of schools in New York City. The inauguration was held outside PS 161 where Aunt Mel taught for so many years. And the new superintendent spoke about how Aunt Mel had changed his life and held a picture of her. It was all over the television so you could imagine for a Caribbean family, that was a, a very proud moment for any family. But uh, when it comes to me and my sister's end, Aunt Mill took us two weeks after we arrived in the United States, where we landed to daily anti-racist demonstrations that were part of the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement, which was blowing up at the time. And that, that act, in a very real sense, became my first political engagement in the United States. My Aunt Mill also fought the racism faced by my sister and I in high school. University, to me, I'll have to admit, all you students out there, it was a blur of protests and you know some parties thrown in as well. Anyway, I did graduate. I became a teacher and I was part of the community control of school struggle in Ocean Hill, Brownsville as part of the Afro-American Teachers Association where we confronted the racism against black and Puerto Rican students. 
It was there that I got to work with and was trained by welfare mothers. Welfare mothers were central to that struggle, although they have not been credited to being central to it. We raised all kinds of help. They taught me what their children needed. Together, we fought for free breakfast program in the schools. We worked with the Black Panther Party to bring in the free breakfast program. And my third grade students at PS 155 in Brooklyn in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, were also part of the campaign to free Angela Davis. And they won an award for a play they wrote about, um, about her. Um, and by the way, this nonsense, this thing you hear about low achievement in inner city schools and they can't learn and all of that. My students in the third grade were reading and discussing New York Times articles. They had a teacher who loved them, who respected them and who put in the work and who also was grounded and connected to the community that they came from. Okay, fast forward. Um, it was, um, I left Ocean Hill Brownsville and became a reading teacher in the SEAT program at Queens College in the City University of New York. That's where I met Andaye, the late Andaye from Guyana, who then became a lifelong friend of mine. We just think of her practically every day. And a woman, uh, Will Met Brown, who was a former Panther, who co-founded Black Women for Wages for Housework with me. We immediately had to confront the racism of racism, the racism of white women in the New York Wages for Housework Committee. They did not approve of the organizing we were doing at Queens College for the right of mothers on welfare to keep their student grants and their welfare without either being cut and for book money for students, many of whom were the children of welfare mothers. They didn't consider that wages for housework, but we did. And when we became active in the UN Women's Decade in preparation for the first US congressionally mandated conference on women, and we wanted to put out a Black Women for Wages for Housework newsletter, they refused to help us. So what we did, we called Selma James all the way in London, England. We knew um, that Selma had training on race. After all, she wrote Sex, Race, and Class, which I write about in the introduction of Selma's anthology, Our Time Is Now. I have the anthology here and encourage all of you to be able to get a copy of it, Sex, Race, Class, and Caring for People and the Planet. I do talk about that. I also have Ndaye's book right here, The Point Is to Change the World, edited by our very own Alyssa Alyssa Trot. So, and also the work that she did um, being the partner um, politically, um, most importantly politically with a CLR James. And if you're from the Caribbean, everybody knew CLR James as a hero of ours. But Salma stood with the black women. She made sure that we got the resources to put out our newsletter called Sapphire. The work we did at that conference in Houston, Texas in 1977, now historic because together with the great leaders of the National Welfare Rights Organization, Johnny Tillman, uh, Beulah Saunders, uh, Frankie Jeter, white woman Christine Morrison out of Washington state, we threw out the welfare resolution that the feminists were going along with and had been put forward. That was a workfare uh, resolution, meaning in order for single mothers to get a little bit of money to help raise their children, they would be forced to go take a job outside the home for next to nothing. We threw that out, we rewrote it, and the language uh, that we put in said that um, women receiving welfare should have the dignity of it being called a wage. Let me just say one other thing though about what happened in, um, in New York with Black Women for Wages for Housework because some people are writing about it and there are all kinds of false stories uh, floating around as though the Wages for Housework campaign ended in 1977. Give me a break. The racism of it is just outrageous because some white women in New York broke, we broke with them actually, the split was over race that the rest of us are erased. And I'll have to say that one of the big shot theorists, um, I was told of Wages for Housework um, campaign, um, you know, from Europe, uh, the first time she met me, I walked through the door, she asked me to clean up some water that was on the floor because she just assumed I was the maid. That is a story that to this day really upsets uh, my daughter Chando greatly. Anyway, 
um, we went on, we did the work in, in Houston. Um, I only had 10 minutes, so there's not a lot of time to go into all of the other work that we have were involved in, in the UN Women's Decade, the resolution, the UN resolution that we won on measuring and valuing unwaged work, the whole international global campaign that we, uh, that we pulled together and went from conference to conference, from uh, Copenhagen, uh, 1980 to Bay. Uh, to Kenya, um, Nairobi in 1985, to Beijing, China in 1995, where we finally won the resolution to measure and value unwaged work in the home, on the land, and in the community. One thing I wanted to say too, uh, just quickly and wrapping up, is that for me especially, but I think for the whole of the Wages for Housework campaign, because there was also a conference in London on immigration, we understood that that valuation of not valuing unwaged work, first of all, impacted women, but it impacted the whole of the global South. We all know that a lot of the work and resources that sustains the lifestyle of those of us who live in the global North come from the global South. It's almost like the whole of the global South are housewives unwage or low wage for the global north. So we understood that measuring and valuing that work was all not only central to exposing the capitalist lie that women's unwage work doesn't contribute to their wealth and their accumulation, but it also exposes how much they're ripping us off in Barbados, how much they're ripping us off in Haiti, in the whole Caribbean region, in the whole of the global south by saying that we're not productive when they are sucking our life's blood and living off of the work uh, that we do. A lot of work that I did around um, the devaluation of the lives of black women, which is connected uh, with the work that I, uh, I did and I'm, I'm still doing around the serial murders of black women in uh, South LA. But I have to say that um, one of this, everything that I've done, one of the most challenging jobs that I have had is that of being a mother. And I'll have to say that my daughter Chanda, um, she helps to center me. She's better known as Sweetie. So if you hear me call her Sweetie, I'm her mother, I'm allowed to do that. You'll know what it's about. She really continues to challenge and center me to this day. And she's a scientist. She's an activist in her field. I couldn't be more proud of her. Um, I hope to be able to share um, more details about the politics that myself and Selma, uh, Nina and Phoebe and so many of us in the Wages for Housework campaign and the global women's strike, which is now in India and in Peru, you know, in Thailand and Ireland, the UK, in the United States, the work that we do on behalf of uh, the Haitian uh, revolutionaries as the uh, Haiti working group, um, within the, the global women's strike. Hopefully we'll have some time to talk a bit more about that. But um, I just wanted to give you a, a bird's eye view of my early days and what really helped to form me, to get me to where I am. And by the way, Selma mentioned that I was married to Sam, her son. I think it speaks to the politics that we have done. Sam and I divorced, long time divorced. And before Sam and after Sam, my relationship with Selma has continued the political relationship that we have had, including some of the work with Sam that he's doing now in Payday Men's Network. And I think that speaks really um, to the work itself and what it is we're trying to do to change the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret, for that. Um, and Sam is here today with us. And thank you for bringing everyone into the room with you. Phoebe, Nina, who's sitting right next to Selma, so many of you um, who are on this call today, Maggie, Renee, and thank you so much. This has been so deeply moving. Between you and Selma, you've just charted decades. And I was really moved to hear you refer to Sweetie, who is about to speak, who we keep making mistakes about. So Chanda actually did her undergrad work at Harvard and her grad work at Waterloo. We will turn it over to you, um, Chanda. Uh, everyone can hear me? Okay, good. Uh, so thank you so much, um, Alyssa and Carrie and everyone who's staffing this. I, am, I wanna start by saying I am shaped by the Tongva land that I grew up in relation with, and I'm now I'm working to live in good relations with the Wabanaki homeland and, and people. Um, and 
I also just want to acknowledge there are a lot of people in the audience from the Wages for Housework campaign who played a big role in raising me. So I'm not just my, my father, Sam Weinstein, and my stepmother, Maria Alba Maldonado, who are in the audience, but also there are just a lot of people who have already been named from the Wages for Housework campaign. So I, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, since, in, in some sense, the subject today is thinking about wages for housework, um, I think that. The, you know, the, the question that I kind of want to put forward to people as, as we think for the rest of the day and, and beyond with each other um, is that in, in a way, Salma and my mother have uh, been my two most significant political influences in thinking about this question of what makes social function possible. So what makes society possible? Um, and, and specifically, what is the labor that makes for me as a scientist, what is the labor that makes the work of science possible? But there are a lot of different ways that we can slice that, right? So one of the things that I'm doing when I acknowledge the people who played a role in raising me is acknowledging that there is labor that produces my presence here um, that has contributed to my presence here. And my mother certainly has did the bulk of that work, um, but she was not alone in doing that work. And I think that um, as, as a single mother, um, she was supported greatly by having a network of people who were thinking about these political questions and translated that into action. So not just theorizing, but actually putting into practice, what does it mean to sustain um, you know, a single black mother who is doing organizing work? So I have, um, as, as a theoretical physicist, so I'm a theoretical cosmologist and particle physicist by training and by, and by um, daily practice. So um, I know at least one of my students is in the audience right now. Um, thank you for coming. Um, so I actually spent most of today thinking about particle physics and thinking about what the dark matter problem is. Um, I also do work in feminist science, technology, and society studies. And the big questions that I'm thinking about is how can Black feminism inform us working in better relations with each other um, within the sciences? And underpinning all of that is thinking about what, do, what, are, what are the power relations? As I think my mom has said to me, I don't know, countless times, what are the power relations that are at work in the, the environment that we are in? Um, what is shaping how we relate to each other? And so again, what is the labor that makes the work of science possible? Um, and so I, I also wanted to acknowledge someone who is not um, physically here with us anymore. Um, but thinking through, um, my first math teacher was my grandmother Elsa, my 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 mom's mother, um, who was a teacher. I grew up. I'm um, uh, sitting at the table with her in Brooklyn, watching her tutor um, other black children in the neighborhood, and that is. The, one of the reasons I was considered advanced at math as a child was because I was sitting there watching her tutor. I'm, you know, someone asked me yesterday, how did I learn how to teach? Um, she was my first teacher about, about how to teach. Um, so I, I want to name that as the labor that produces me as a scientist, that caretaking work of feeding me, of taking care of me. I've, I've, you know, creating space for my mom to do her own work um, by doing the child, by doing that child care. I'm watching me. I, I also want to name like an important piece of work that she did, which is that the Wages for Housework campaign would occasionally descend on New York to lobby at the United Nations. And um, I got to go on one of those trips and that was quite an experience. Um, their home base for those activities was my grandmother's house in Brooklyn. Um, she cooked for them. She let them take over her kitchen. People stayed all over the house. Um, and, and she just did that, that housework. And so I also want to talk about that. I wanted to mention that housework that made the organizing for wages for housework possible. Mom, I'm really sorry for making you cry. <laughs> that was not the intention. Um, but again, for me, I, I want to put that out there as a lesson for me of how we need to look holistically at the power relations, at the support, at the unwaged work that makes all of the things that we do together, whether it is our organizing work or not, possible. Um, and and so I, I, I just want to name my grandmother Elsa as someone who really provided um, an influence there. Um, 
So I'm going to, I'm going to try and stay on, on the shorter side, um, because I know we also have questions to get to. Um, the, the thing that I, I, I want to land at is I also want to acknowledge, in particular, I want to name Wahikea Maile, who is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, who is in the audience. He is Kanaka Maoli. Um, he's a Native Hawaiian. Um, and I, I want to identify the University of Toronto as one of the institutions that is supporting the building of the 30 meter telescope on unceded Kanaka Maoli land. Um, the 30 meter telescope is a proposed instrument. It would be the largest in the world. It is um, Kanaka Maoli um, knowledge keepers and cultural knowledge holders have been opposing the building of, of this instrument for a long time. And so I, I just wanna mark that piece of, of all of our complicated institutional relationships that even as we are employed within these institutions that we are sometimes called to resist them or primarily called to resist them um, often in, in the work that we do. And I just wanted to share a little bit about my journey in becoming part of the community that works in solidarity and in conversation with, with Kanaka Maoli people um, when I was in college, um, and this is why the fact that I went to Harvard is relevant, I was extremely a fish out of water at Harvard in a bunch of ways that's, um, well, you can read about it in my, my book if you want, I talk a little bit about it. One of the stories that I tell in the book is that when I was a junior, um, with a completely like flailing GPA, but also with aspirations to go to graduate school, I was offered the opportunity to take a job at a new telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Um, that would have written my ticket academically. I would have been able to get into any graduate program. The salary that they were offering me was twice what my mother had, had basically raised me on. And it was an incredible opportunity. Um, I turned it down I, after I read that there was a picket line. And I wrote to the guy who offered it to me and said, I don't cross picket lines. I grew up in a labor family. And this is really, I spent a lot of time on picket lines with my, my dad, Sam, and with my, my stepmother, Maria Elba, as a kid. So I understood picket lines and that we just don't cross them. Um, the reason that I want to mention that example, so that was my first introduction. Nobody in the astronomy community at the time was talking about questions of ethics and ethical responsibility to the people of the land or the land that we use. And we were taught that astronomy was completely separate from these ethical considerations. Um, in that moment, I was asked the question by the universe, by, by you know coincidence, however you want to think about it, um, was I going to choose personal success over solidarity? And repeatedly in my career, I had to choose solidarity over personal success. And it has come at cost, including talking about the 30 meter telescope in public. Um, there were jobs that were closed off to me. I spent eight years as a postdoc. And certainly part of that was the organizing work that I did around the 30 meter telescope. I'm not saying that because I think I'm some kind of hero or champion, but only to say to make manifest the institutional pressures that are working on us if we have curiosities that we want to follow through the academy is making this promise to us that there are things that we can have as long as we are allowed to leave our values behind and there was this question of one I wasn't going to cross a picket line but the second time that I was really confronted with the question of solidarity with um the kiai the the protectors of Mauna Kea I'm um, was it was in the winter of 2014 2015 and at that moment one of the things that was different for me was that I more fully understood myself not just as a, a, a black woman who grew up in the United States middle name sojourner the sojourner was I'm um, Selma's idea as far as I understand it um, but I also understood myself as someone who maybe had not been born and raised in the islands, but was of Barbados. And so the question that I asked myself was, these island people, if they were my island people, what would I want other island people to do? And so there was an element of my identity as a Caribbean person that was shaping the call to solidarity, that if what is happening in Mauna Kea was happening in Barbados, that I would want people to stand with me. And so I was going to stand with the other island people of the world in their fights for um, autonomy uh, over their land. Um, so all of this 
comes back in some way to thinking about wages for housework, which for, for me was my first box of thinking about what are the power relations and what are the power relations that we don't talk about. So we can talk, and I love talking about the night sky and how beautiful the night sky is. And we could talk about how beautiful the images from the 30 meter telescope would be. And I have done that. In fact, at the Kia'i, what I found was that people were very curious about the telescope, contrary to what a lot of astronomers were saying in public. Um, but we need to talk about the power relations that produce those images. And so for me, wages for housework teaches us, it's not just about the movement to get wages for housework. And I think that that's a really critical thing. I think during this pandemic, people have realized that housework is work. Um, those worlds have started to collide in ways that, that people weren't willing to acknowledge before. But I think it also trained me to think in a particular way. And I think that that's also important is that sometimes this is a training ground for helping you to see things that um, we are otherwise trained not to see. So I'll stop there. Thanks, sweetie. What an absolutely astounding set of reflections um, uh, about history, about context, about where you've come from, about the communities in which you're embedded. Uh, maybe we can all turn on our, our, our cameras, Alyssa and Selma, at this point, and uh, uh, microphones, and open this conversation up still more. Um, we had actually imagined beginning our questions with a focus on relationships. But um, as you've all heard, um, uh, Selma and Margaret and Chanda have way outstripped this. Uh, they've given us <laughs> immense, immense insight already into the foundational, uh, 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 absolutely crucial role of relationships to everything that they've done. So I feel at this point compelled to say, um, uh, is there anything more um, uh, that, and, and, and more specific that you would wanna share with us now about the role of the relationships among you uh, in uh, your learning and your politics. Uh, you're all part of this remarkable multi-generational family of transformational anti-racist, anti-colonial, uh, anti-sexist activism. Um, uh, um, you're clearly, uh, utterly connected to each other, but is there anything more you want to share about the force and the fabric of those relationships in your life and in your politics? And anyone <laughs> should feel free to, to just jump in or say something at this point. And so, I, yeah, I, I, I think that the what we have learned from the struggles of women we have been involved with has transformed us. Um, uh, that begins very early, you know, in the 30s, my mother used to break the lock of the, of the, of the flat where, my, where a family had been put on the street and moved the furniture back in and because she said they had a right to be there whether they could pay the rent or not. And my mother was five foot tall. And when she told me the story, she said, I'm five foot, but I moved that rice box in. Um, and that was a part of how um, I grew up knowing the enormous struggles that women have been involved in in, the, in Trinidad and Tobago, the women made all kinds of uh, arrangements in order to be able to be part of the movement and told the men they had to leave, they had to go to meetings, they, they, and, the, and the, the men had to take care of the children so that they could do that. And the independence struggle and the federation struggle meant that they used it in order to liberate themselves. And one woman had to climb out of the window because her husband would lock her in. I only heard about that recently. 
but we found ways of struggling and um, Margaret came in with that understanding of wages for housework that she got from the welfare mothers, which was a tremendous movement. And I couldn't understand and still do not how you can have a movement of millions of women, which is not called a women's movement because the women are demanding money and because they are not white. You know, this has been an agitation for me and, and really talks about the class line in feminism and the race line in feminism, which clearly um, echoes that more than once. And also we've been involved in a number of countries. Margaret spoke about some of them. And I want to, at a later point today, to speak about how the autonomy works in such a way that we can be involved in all kinds of struggles and they can be involved in, in struggles through us where the differences among them are not dividers, but strengths that each has and draws on when they need to. Uh, that's what our work is based on. It's based on our, um, our concentrating on our own struggle, but never ignoring or forgetting or refusing to support other struggles and to understand how much these other struggles, which don't seem to be ours, are in fact ours. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I could add, add just, just quickly a couple of things. One is that I remember, and I think this was maybe after I was four, um, lying on the grass in my village and of uh, being a little hungry because maybe we had one meal, right, for the day and thinking that I'm hungry, no child should ever have to be hungry. And then I grew up, I want to do something about it. And I think that had something to do also with that. And also uh, Chanda talked about my mother, uh, mom, Elsa, and one of the things I realized that she was training us in, in our village, you know, at dinner time we were pretty hungry. And there was an elder who lived across the street named Miss Rice. And my mother would say, before you sit down and eat that food, you take this food across the street to Miss Rice. And my sister and I would say, but mommy, can't we eat first? And then we take the food and she's saying, no, she eats first and then you sit down and eat. And I didn't realize the, 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 the lesson that my mother was teaching me. You asked about the relations though. The first time I went to London and I was driving around with Selma, you know, we work our butt off. I grew up next to a cane field in Barbados. I saw how hungry people, how hard people work. None of the wealth or most of it wasn't there. At that time, there wasn't even much of a middle class in Barbados. I went to England and I was shocked when I went to visit Port Solveig was living in some uh, squat with no electricity, no water. People had rising damp on, on the walls. And driving around, I saw this big able statue that I think Queen Elizabeth or something had made for her son, Prince Albert. And I broke down and I wept. As Selma understood that, I knew that Selma understood why I was, you know, it wasn't just some missionary comfort thing. She knew the whole experience and what was being expressed as a former uh, colonial in that mo moment about relationships among us. One other thing I wanna mention about Chanda, I don't know if she remembers, I can't remember what grade she was in, but Chanda decided that she was gonna make up, um, she had a little rainbow flag. I think this was maybe before the rainbow flag was the LGBTQ flag, but anyway, it represented the globe. It had a globe in the middle of it. And Chanda got up and did a pledge of allegiance to the earth. <laughs> she was just a little thing. And somehow she got invited onto the stage. Chanda, I can't remember the name of that big uh, performer. He was very, very popular in the LA Coliseum. MC there were thousands Hammer. of people. MC uh -huh. Hammer. MC She's talking Hammer. about MC and Hammer. there was little Chanda standing with her flag, right? Making her statement on the environment and, and for the earth. And uh, that was just something that just so, uh, so moved me. So I just wanted to share a few of those stories about uh, the family and about some of the things that, that happen and those kinds of interactions. 
Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you. Sandra, did you have any thoughts on? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I feel like I'm in, in I'm, as a physicist, I think in terms of symmetries, right? So I'm thinking of all of the things that are not symmetric here as, as though I'm, you know, I had the unusual experience relative to my mom and Selma of knowing them my entire lives. And as Selma, as my, for my entire life, as Selma was talking about before, she's only known me for a little under 40 years, which I appreciate. She said this before we got started. I appreciate the generosity of saying a little under 40 years. Um, although we are, we are coming up on, on the 40 year mark of our acquaintance um, in, in not too long. Um, so I think there's a comment here to be made about what it means to be a movement baby. And I think something that isn't uh, talked about um, enough, uh, either out in my experience in organizing spaces or actually in the academic literature that I have read about organizing is the particular experience of, of um, what it is to be a movement baby. And so I grew up, um, with a, a cohort of, of what were at the time called campaign kids. And um, I just have to kind of make a sidebar comment about that. You know, in these stories, um, my mom was mentioning earlier, uh, the, the discussions that, for example, in Sylvia Federici's work, um, the suggestion that the Wages for Housework campaign ended in 1977 or collapsed in 1977. And I was born in 1982, so I don't know how you explain my entire childhood as a campaign kid if there was no wages for housework campaign or any of the photos that I have of myself in front of wages for housework banners. I am, there is a way in which I had um, people who were like siblings to me. We were not at all in biological relation with each other, but we had this, this cohort. Um, there is also, um, I think it would be fair to say, a sacrifice that is asked of children of the movement, um, particularly because our, our parents are being asked to make sacrifices, and those sacrifices do get passed down and do become um, part of the entire family relation. And so I think that that's one of the, you know, when we talk about power relations, it's one of the relations that needs to be made manifest. And when I talk about parents making sacrifices, like as I write in my book, I think in an alternate universe, where my mother didn't have to, you know, struggle to ensure that children don't starve. Um, and and I'm, I want to be clear that I think it's incredibly important that she's done that work. But in an al alternate universe, I think she would have been an amazing professional fashionista. Um, like if I at all ever look cool, it's because like she trained me to look cool, right? There's this whole artistic side to my mother um, that has had less time because the world needed saving. Um, so I think, you know, there are a lot of different ways to slice that, but I think, you know, the, the thing that I want to say since I have a captive audience is to start thinking about what does it do to our family re relations to be called to do this work? Um, and and that, is, that is challenging. And I think it's challenging. Everybody on each side of that has their own experience of the blessings and the challenges that come with that. Um, so I don't think, you know, I think being a movement parent is also probably a whole um, experience that I don't know as someone who is not a parent. Um, but I think that that's, that's the comment that I want to make about, you know, wages for housework, again, has taught me to think, to how to think about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Shanda. You're gonna make us all cry today because I think you're putting really important and hard questions on the table, you know? And say for those of us, for example, who are in the academy, um, which is where this place is being held, it has been in Women and Gender Studies, such an honor to ensure that our intro students have been exposed to the work of Selma and Margaret. You know, one year, I remember, students had a question about Article 88 in the Venezuelan constitution. I emailed Selma and she wrote back and the students were just thrilled. Um, but I also think what you're saying there about family really reminds us, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's about our responsibility, our accountability, and also humility, right, in terms of the folks who are out there beating the pavement, doing the work, 
um, and could be doing all of these other things as well and make choices. And what does it mean for us? What responsibility does it call, um, does it call forth from us? We have so many comments coming in. I'm just gonna ask one question and then try to go to the audience comments. And that question is because I think it's a really important one and, and Selma really um, flagged that we wanted to get to this. This is the question of autonomy. And I think it's really key because you can't talk about solidarity and you can't talk about difference and power without talking about autonomy. So for all of you, Margaret and Selma firstly, autonomy is key to wages for housework and the global strike. Can you explain for the audience, what does autonomy mean for the movement work that you have been engaged in for decades? How does autonomy enable movements to challenge hierarchies of power and differences, differences that, that are the result of inequalities? Why is autonomy and separatism not the same? Why should we not confuse the two? And organizationally, you know, because you have students who are reading these things always in class, but how does it actually work organizationally? And Chanda, for you, you know, I'm reading a comment in the chat. Folks who have questions or comments you want everyone to see, please put them in the Q&A, because if you put them into the chat, it only comes to the hosts and panelists. But, but Benita Lawrence, who is an incredible Indigenous scholar at York University and was involved in Wages for Housework way back when, has a really poignant comment for us in there talking about the importance of addressing caring and on wage work, but a side comment about the fact that she began in the sciences before moving into social sciences and into indigenous studies. And she references the work she did not do in the struggle to survive in sciences, which sort of reminds us, um, Chanda, in your book about in some ways how lonely the work must be as a you know, black queer gender theoretical physicist. So what does autonomy mean to you? Because who are the folks where do you find communities of solidarity to address the kinds of specific issues? If there's like only two other black feminist physicists, like where the hell do you go to, to have that conversation, to come back to make the kinds of challenges that you do? Can I say, can I begin by saying there, there is no unity without it, autonomy, because autonomy begins with each individual sector making its own autonomous case in a way which makes them also accountable to other sectors. That is, you are not divided by your uniqueness. You are united by what your uniqueness brings to the struggle of all of the rest of us, we have we began with um, the autonomy of lesbian women within the Wages for Housework campaign. They were accountable to everybody else in the campaign, but everybody in the campaign was accountable to them. That then became. Black Women for Wages for Housework, another organization within the campaign, which was accountable to the campaign, but everybody in the campaign was also accountable to women of color, which is what they call themselves now, women of color in the global women's strike. And that went on with sex workers. For those of us, um, all of us, who are people with disabilities, you know, my hearing is bad. I have a right to make my case for hearing, but I have a responsibility to be accountable to others who are in wheelchairs, who are people of color, who are being deported, who are fighting military dictatorships. I must be accountable to others and I must expect and hope and encourage others to be accountable to my sector as well. That is not separatism because separatism turns its back on other sectors, even those that want to support you. We don't, we don't turn our back on support. We are accountable to others 
and we expect and hope and encourage people to be accountable to us. The same thing is true with women and men. That's why we have a group of men of payday, which is accountable to the women. And we are also accountable to them. That's why we don't suffer from sexism within the Wages for Housework campaign, which has become the global women's strike. But I think it's really crucial that this accountability really works on an international level. We work with the Karen women who are organizing the defense of people who are running from the bombs of the military uh, and we support what they do. We work with the women in Thailand who are trying to save, regenerate the soil and keep the soil and stop the, um, uh, the mining and regenerate the soil around the mines and uh, it, keep the trees and, um, and who are sex workers and who some of whom are um, workers in the sweatshops. We have relationships with women in India who are farm workers and who have just gained up about a hundred of them, um, Adivasi and, um, um, and Dalit women who are, um, who are getting land for themselves. There is a great movement of women in Andhra Pradesh. A million women are doing another kind of farming, natural farming, which has the possibility, first of all, of keeping the children healthy and keeping us all healthy, but also being able to reverse, at least to stop global warming and maybe even reverse it. And we're, we're doing support work for them. And they want to, re these people who are in struggle, they want the support. They don't turn their nose up at support and they are aware of the work that we do. They are aware of the care income, which we are fighting for, which they can see the value of because they are doing work on the land without payment to save it. And uh, we are saying they have a right to an income for the work that they and we are doing. The same thing applies to women in a number of countries in Africa who are fighting for the, for the end of the privatization of their land for cash crops when they want to be able to, um, to grow their own food and feed their own children. We know about um, the struggle for the environment if we are women. We know struggling against for our children's health. We are the protectors of the children against racism, against pollution, against injustice. Um, we are justice workers. We do justice work if we are unwaged housewives carers, grandmothers, we fight the pipelines. There are all kinds of struggles that we are involved in as women, as autonomous women, bringing the men along, bringing the community along, strengthening uh, their right to a life and strengthening their organization. and. The autonomy enables that kind of support, of mutual support and advertising of our struggles and what we have been able to win and what we hope to win and how we can work together on an international level, despite differences of language, of culture and of uh, historical background. There, there is no other way to do it. You know, you look at the movements today and the ones like the Indian strike of millions, they come together. They haven't lost their religion. They have responded to the religion of others 
as part of what the community on, on strike for a year and going back on strike on the 23rd and 24th of February, they have autonomy, they have the right to their religion, and they have the right to defend others. That's what we want. That's what works. That's what has kept us going for almost 50 years. Yeah, th thank you for that. I'm not sure, Alyssa, or one of you to give us um, should I weigh in on that or do we want to go on to the question for Chanda? I'm looking at the, the clock, so I just want to. But I think sure. they're, they're all sort of being answered because the question was about autonomy. Um, right. Selma started answering and has answered in a way that has opened up to answer a question posed by my colleague Carolyn Shanaz Hussain about what, what does a people centered economy also and society look like? And so I think for both of you, to jump in on either of those points or questions would be fine. And then we're probably going to go to one or two more questions. I'm gonna put a, a, a link in the chat because Selma is so wide ranging, it's incredible. And a former professor here who left the academy, Sarah Abram used to be in the sociology department has just published three wonderful interviews, including with women talking about this strike in India in Against the Current, which is a, an online magazine that she's on the editorial board of. Um, so I'm gonna post that link for folks to read up on that um, is pretty incredible. But I think, Margaret, if you and Chanda can answer this, because it's, you know, it's answering Carolyn's questions as well, we'll go to one or two more questions. Right, well, as in my journalist work, I'm always telling people answer the question. One thing I do want to comment though on autonomy, uh, picking up on something Selma said, and then I will go to that, which is, um, it was really the possibility of autonomy that brought me as a woman, a black woman of uh, African Caribbean descent into the campaign. The fact that Selma wrote sex, race and class, you know, a lot of people use the term intersectionality. I don't know too many grassroots women that I work with at the base that taught like that intersectionality. But so, the title of Selma's book, Sex, Race and Class, what do you call that? You call that intersectional? Mm -hmm. Also in the study group um, that I was in with Andaye, your mentor, um, Audrey Lord was part of um, a study group with us for a period of time. And actually she was a big support. She was part of the first or maybe the second grouping of wages for the black women for wages for housework in New York. And we would have conversations about how as a black woman, as an immigrant, as a lesbian, as low income, whatever, that we are all of it and that we can't cut off part of ourselves for the other. So will you call that? intersectionality, we didn't come up with that term, but all I'm saying, this is something that we have known and we have talked about for a very long time. So I'm also talked about accountability. And I also wanna mention that in terms of the movement now, because a lot of people have trouble with exactly what that means, especially what it means in relation to race. There's practically nothing in the United States, I don't know, but Canada I suspect is true there as well, that isn't viewed from the lens of race. And you have a lot of very well-meaning white people or people, not people of color, who haven't had the training that we have had, we have been fortunate to have in the global women's strike on race. So they have no idea about accountability. They have no idea that it's important to find out what the, the black women think, what do the indigenous women think when they're coming up with a particular strategy or tactic, they feel they could go ahead and develop it without discussing it or any input uh, from us. And that's supposed to be perfectly reasonable. I'm not gonna say any more about it than that. But I also want to, you know, I just wanna underscore that point for, for people who are out there. There's a reason for autonomy. It doesn't mean that every person of color, every black person is somebody who, um, may not be on the other side. We just have to look at what is happening in, in Haiti. And I wanna really lift up uh, Haiti, a CPL of OCA from the Haiti Action Committee, a great, great Haitian leader was on the call. I'm not sure he's was is able to stay because he's always up to his eyeballs with the movement on the ground and the demands there. Um, you know, we all owe a great debt to Haiti. 
Without Pierre is still with you here today. The way. Mm -hmm for the whole emancipation, the ending of slavery in the whole of the Americas. When Latin America was, Bolivar was fighting for the liberation of Latin America after the Haitian revolution, they Haiti gave refuge to Bolivar. They sent ships, they sent fighters. Even the great expansion of the United States would not have happened without Haiti. There is a reason that Haiti has been so maligned, has been so kept down. And the Haitian people who have a revolutionary tradition who are saying today, Today, we are trying to complete our revolution that they began in 1804, from Bussa Revolution in 1816 to the revolutions that spread in Grenada and throughout the Caribbean region, in the United States, in New Orleans, etc. Haitians inspired and very involved in that. There's a lot more I could say about Haiti, but I won't now, but hopefully we could put some things in the links for people who want to support the grassroots in Haiti of some of the things that they can do. So a lot of us are very, very committed to that struggle um, in, in, in Haiti and want to be accountable uh, to that struggle in Haiti. Um, I got so involved with that, um, Alyssa, I forgot the other part of your question. I beg your pardon there. No, it's it's great. I mean, the, the big question was around autonomy. Um, and, okay. and and so you so you've actually answered that. And, and then it was followed up by a question in the chat by Carolyn Hussein on a people centered economy. And you sort of answered that by referring to the long struggle and the debt that we all owe, um, the debt the, the debt that we all owe to, to Haiti. Um, yeah, and the, the Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of people got really confused about that because people started mixing up um, autonomy with separatism and not getting the point that the Black Lives Matter movement is saying if Black lives don't count, the lives of none of us uh, count. So we have to keep our eyes open in front of us and behind us to know who's using race to pimp off the movement, who's using race to just put themselves forward or who are really about building from an autonomous base, which by the way, Malcolm X did. Once he dropped his separatism, he came back from Mecca and said he's ready to work with everybody who, who is for human rights, but he did it from an autonomous base. And I think we have to wrap our heads um, around uh, what that means. And I think I'll, I'll uh, just leave it at that and maybe go on to hear what Chanda has to say. On this. Yeah, I wonder if we could, yeah, mm -hmm. indeed. And, you know, again, there's so many questions coming in. We're probably going to have to go to one question um, before we close. This could go on forever. And just, I just wanted to shout out Margaret Busby, who is in the house, who is, you know, the editor of um, most recently New Daughters of Africa, and I think was one of the youngest and first Black female publishers in the UK with Alison and Busby. We have, you know, Gail Lewis in the house. It's just remarkable, the audience that's here today. Chanda, I wondered if you could... Um, comment on this question of autonomy and on what it means to build a community in, in science. And there's a question from Donna Barnett, who sort of wondered if you could reflect on this as well within the context of some of the, you know, the, the work in, in, in your book. And I, I suppose the chapter in particular on, on, um, on the physics of melanin. Um, so I, I wondered if there's a way that we could try to figure out how to tie all of that together. And then we'll go to this last question about the academy. Yeah, I think unfortunately there probably isn't a way for me to pull the physics of melanin into that. So I'm sorry uh, that I won't be able to get to that question. Um, but I think that this question about autonomy and organizing within the academy is a very important one, particularly because of the dynamics that arise between organizing communities and the academy, um, which can be very predatory. Um, I, I think that there's a, a real problem with, with predatory relationships between the academy and, and, and organizers in particular. There is also this question of what happens when you are, um, you know, what, how I'm often termed a barrier breaker. I'm the first black woman in North America to hold a tenure track faculty position in theoretical cosmology and, and in particle theory. Um, in either of those topics, um, which means that in a lot of ways, as you said, Alyssa, I'm an isolated person in a particular way. And there are different ways of getting along when you are isolated in that way. So one of the ways that I have seen um, senior women um, and, and, and gender minorities, but broadly senior white women get along is by being as awful as the old boys club. 
Um, and that is, and, and I've also seen women of my generation who get along by being as awful as the old boys club. And that is one, that is one way that people, particularly people who don't have a political analysis, who, you know, didn't grow up in the wages for housework campaign, et cetera, um, or who grew up in an environment where their social training actively teaches them that solidarity is a bad thing. Um, that they don't have any way of thinking about power relations other than to try and cleave to the most powerful and perform fealty to that power. Um, so that challenge is put before us as, as Black women, as people of color, as, as gender minorities, the different ways that we are marginalized, um, which is do we, as much as we can't physically can, and that varies person to person, try to fit in or I'm, um, you know, what else do we do with ourselves when we find that we're the only ones in the room? And so, you know, I think that there are a couple of answers, which is um, it's important for us to continuously um, work to engage and uh, produce uh, good relations with people who are doing grassroots work. And that is not something that's just going to fall in your lap. You have to go out and be responsible to the communities that you are in literally geographically that can also in my case like I talked about um the the work that I have done supporting the Kia'i around Mauna Kea I am um, to stay engaged with people outside of the academy who are among the grassroots I think the other thing is is that um you cannot use identity as a simple marker for where you can do political building. And so I just want to name, for example, um, Brian Shuvey, who's in the audience, who's a, a gay white male theoretical physicist, also a University of Toronto alum, actually. Um, he's a member of Particles for Justice with me. We're a multiracial, mostly white, but multiracial, multinational group of people. Um, some of us were raised as radicals, identify as like anarchists. Other people are like very comfortable working within the Democratic Party. At the same time, we have found a way to work with each other across different sets of values. Um, to focus on values that we do share. I see Shada, who is a professor at Carleton University, one of our multinational members is, is also in the audience. Um, so I think that it's important to find your people and understand that your people may not look like what you think they are going to look like. And so autonomy and solidarity is also going to, and I think this is something that I really, I heard autonomy a lot as a kid. It was a big word that I learned early on. Um, the, that dynamic of finding your people who are willing to be in solidarity with you. And, and I want to give a specific example also of Brian Nord, who's another Black theoretical cosmologist, um, that Brian, um, as a man, has been given the option of fitting in with the old boys club in the Black physics community and has repeatedly turned down that social location out of solidarity with me. And so those are choices that we are all allowed to make along the way, and I think are totally in line with, um, I really want to encourage particularly the young folks who are thinking about organizing to pay attention to what Selma said about autonomy and how autonomy is not a strategy for division, but it is a strategy for autonomy, for solidarity. Autonomy is a strategy for solidarity. Um, and we can construct that in, in, in different ways. And so I, I think for people who are thinking about, should I pick up Our Time Is Now? Or Sex, Race, and Class, the, the previous collection, pick it up for that reason alone so you can understand that organizing theory. There's lots of other great stuff, but that one thing alone by itself makes it worth it. Thank you so much, Chanda. And the, you I, know, wanted, I wanted to say one thing. I'm so delighted with what my granddaughter said about autonomy is, but she said solidarity. What I'm, why, why I use the word unity, Chanda, rather than solidarity is because people send you a message of solidarity and go about their business. I know you didn't mean that, but we have to be careful about that. We want to be involved in the people, with the people who are doing other struggles because they are telling us what we should think. They're enlarging our view. 
and they're widening the movement. I must refer to what I said earlier. CLR James started an organization so that the third layer would be directing it, maybe not in the leadership, but nevertheless directing it because what we think and what we are involved in and what our struggle is, is precisely what must be the cutting edge of the movement we are part of. And Margaret makes this terrific point against a separatism we form movements that base themselves on what we do or who we are or what our particular struggle is. Fine, but all the classes are in that movement and we fight the class struggle within those movements. And Margaret has been one of the best people we have to fight that kind of struggle, not only against racism, but against class, um, the, the imposition of a higher sector of the class against the lower sector. We start at the bottom. We don't want a bottom in the society. We all move up or we're not getting anywhere. Yeah, and Selma, I'll, I'll have to say that also, I think that without uh, unity, there really is no solidarity. So I think I know we talk, we say, even in the story, we talk about solidarity with Haiti, et cetera, et cetera. We know very well what we mean. So I think we have to look at the word within that context in terms of right. unity and solidarity. Yes, mm -hmm. and the autonomy allows us to be those in struggle who are hidden from us. I want to give one particular example, there are many, and that is women in Palestine if they were not fighting to keep, to stay in Palestine, despite all that Israel is throwing at them, we would lose that battle. But women in Palestine have been extraordinary in making life, despite the Israelis' attempt to shut life down where they are concerned. Um, so, and that's what women are doing in a lot of places in the world. Um, and uh, Margaret knows absolutely um, even better than I, the women in Haiti and how they are making a life when, um, when they never intended to give us any life at all. They were furious, the power, powers that be are furious that, that Haitians have taken their autonomy and refuse to give it up. Yeah, and and no, I know no. we want to go on to yeah, no, we no, want no, to go on to, we want to go on to the next question. This is really such a, a vital uh, discussion because what I meant to say earlier, and I want to pick up on the points Chanda made about our people don't necessarily look like us in relationship to Haiti. If we look at uh, Baby Doc a dark skinned black man. If we look at the, the, the thief that, well, well was, um, was killed by God knows who, uh, Jovenel Moise recently in Haiti, another black man. We can't assume that because somebody looks like us that they are our people. So I wanted to underscore that point as we're looking to build unity, whether we call it unity, we call it solidarity. I think we have to keep that in mind is sometimes it confuses us. And that's why we get confused with separatism and autonomy, because it's like, we can't work with people who don't look like us, right? We don't wanna have nothing to do with white people or indigenous people or whatever. We have to be only in our own community with people who look exactly like us. It's not like that. That is not autonomy. That is separatism. That's not about building unity, building solidarity. I just wanted to underscore that. Thank you. No, that's wonderful. We can listen to you all all day, and so I'm, you know, I'm just reminded of how much I I love you guys. This is incredible. I'm going to ask folks. We still have over 200 folks here. I'm going to ask one sort of final question, and really just ask folks to stay with us to the end in tribute to this remarkable panel and to the elder Selma, who is up past nine in London and still here with us, and Nina. Um, uh, Selma's uh, partner, please show yourself, Nina, 
um, who is, is sitting there. And I really uh, need to say that, you know, Nina is the joint coordinator of the Global Women's Strike and the founder of Legal Action for Women, um, an activist and herself an author of several volumes, including The Milk of Human Kindness and Creating a Caring Economy that charts the work of Nora Castaneda and the Women's Development Bank of Venezuela under the Bolivarian Revolution. So thank you, Nina, so much for being here, Solveig and all of the others. This last question I'm gonna to put to the three of you uh, again, Selma and Margaret, and slightly differently for Chanda. Selma, I was listening to an interview of yours last night with Siddharth Bhatia from The Wire, in which you defined yourself as a working class woman, woman with a secondary education who was accepted at a university, but decided not to go because, quote, I thought it would ruin my mind, end quote. To both you and Margaret, where and when do you choose to engage with academics or not? Tell me, you talk about ambition being the enemy of any movement, and that applies so much to this world we live in that Chanda could speak about. When and where do you choose to engage with academics in the work that you do? What are you looking for and what are you looking to avoid? I want and Chanda, I just let me just ask Chanda the Chanda Donna Barnett has put several questions here, loves the cover of your book, and keeps wanting to hear how cosmology relates to this question of organizing of justice, says it is within this space of finding your people that particles vibrate and are drawn to each other on an energetic level. So I wondered if in your reflection on your role as a scientist in the academy, as a, a, you define yourself as a black agenda feminist physicist who is rethinking what you want science to do in the world, if you could speak a bit about, you know, you have this incredible um, section in your book where you say it's not just about the Milky Way or the nighttime sky, it's about what are the conditions that our communities need to be able to see the Milky Way, to be able to see the nighttime sky, to be able to experience the ocean. And I wondered if you could reflect on that and your responsibility as a non untenured scientists, right? And I'm so glad that you called out Waikia Miley, who has done such incredible activist work on this campus, an untenured Indigenous colleague in the Department of Political Science, if you could perhaps reflect on that. So we'll go to, I guess, Margaret Salma, in, in whatever order, all three of you, to help close out this remarkable afternoon. Uh, I, I wanted to refer to Ireland and I know Maggie Ronane is on, and Maggie is our point of reference in Ireland, and she works in the academy, what you call the academy um, in, in a university. She not only has helped to fight against the Elisu Dam in Turkey with her academic work, but also she has completely um, undermined the hierarchy in her university where women were taught, were called teachers when they were lecturers so they could get less money, where the cleaners were not, were divided by race, where um, there was discrimination because of caring work and she made it clear and has, and has fought a struggle with many women at the university to break the divisions um, among the different layers of women so that they are not any of them punished because they do caring work and therefore are not accessible to the university in the way that the university would like us as slaves. Okay, we want information we want you to present our struggles, to spread our struggles. We need to know about them. You know about them often when we don't because you move in areas where you can know. We must know what other women and men are doing in other places and you have to report them to us. But we don't want you to take those struggles, to build a career on it and not even let us know they're going on or use them as if you discovered the struggle, the, the ideas 
and the perspective that the struggle fought very hard to find and to publicize and to use in their own struggle. We, we are very concerned, <clears throat> you know, we did, uh, the English Collective of Prostitutes did a whole project with a number of academics who were ready to present their views about it. We didn't want their views about sex work. Sex workers have their views about sex work and we wanted those to be presented and we wanted their struggle presented and she absolutely refused to accept their work unless the terms were clear that they were to be respectful of what they were reporting and report accurately what the struggle was about. We are welcome um, academics. Maggie is a very welcome member. You know, we love her. She does the work of the campaign within academia and takes a lot of guff as a result of it because they don't like at all that this woman is not worried about her career but the first thing she's worried about is that the women are kept not getting the rights or the wages, the wages that they're entitled to, and that their caring work is not being acknowledged as part of the work that they must do. It, we, we have uh, workers in our network who are um, domestic workers who's um, the academia is ready to take the work that they do and the struggle that they have made as part of what will enhance their career, but they're not ready to work with them and for them in order to get the, sec the, the domestic workers, the information and the power that they are entitled to have. When they find those, when they find those academics, they welcome them, but otherwise they feel picked off. They feel that they are they are helping somebody to get a career, but they're not helping their struggle, and that's and we want our struggle represented, but we want your struggle to be represented, and if they don't want to publish what we want, we collectively want, we'd like to support your struggle to see that it's published and to see that you get what you are entitled to as part of the working class. Yeah, to, to, pick, up, to pick up on that, one of the uh, things we were doing at the start of Black Women for Wages for Housework, we were all in an academy. We were at Queens College at the City University of New York, and Dae was there. Um, you know, so so many of us um, were there from Africa, from the Caribbean region. People who wanted to go back, which and Dae did do uh, to Guyana. Early on um, in Black Women for Wages for Housework, in some of the early writings we did, we were concerned about the division between the academy and the community, and that the resources of the academy be made available to those of us, you know, in the community, because there are a lot of struggles, um, as Chanda and uh, Selma said, that happens in the community that are uh, vital for those in the academy to know about. Now, I happen to think that we could find our people, except you're like in the 1%, I'm assuming that every profession, whether it's in sport, it's in the academy, it's in the political class, there are going to be people who are against our movement. And part of what we do in a very practical way, because we want to win, we want to find our people so that we're able to bring people together so that together we can get what it is, the resources, the knowledge, the research, et cetera, that we need. And that's a, an approach that I have found useful that in early Black Women for Wages for Housework, we were working on, we continue to work on. We understand what Selma has pointed out 
um, because even if you look at history, so much of um, working class history, if you want to use that word, so much of, of women's history, so much of people, academics, some academics are now doing um, increasing research during the slave trade of the women being used as breeders, for example. There's a lot of useful work that is going on. And I think that the um, you know, the challenge that we have to face in crossing the divides, like crossing any divide, is crossing that academic and community divide and really finding people that we can work with so that we can move forward and we can win. We want to be able to bring people together. We want to bring people together who are like-minded, who share our goals, who want wages for housework, who are anti-capitalist and who are ready to do the work that we want to do. What we don't want to happen is like what Chanda referred to of somebody running around saying wages for housework in the academy ended in 1977 and people really not challenging it. That's the kind of people in the academy that we really have issues with. But I, I, I you know, covered quite a lot. The work that students are doing on the justice for janitors, the 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 hunger strikes that have gone on on, on in within the academy of people standing as Selma we use Ireland as an example. That is one example. There have been examples, numerous examples of that happening on campuses across the United States. And I think we also have to recognize that as well. So my approach, and I, I think the approach would be is. As Salma said, we welcome people in the academy who are on our side. We know that we have to find a way for resources at the academy um, to be of value and useful to people within the community and also vice versa. You know, we, you know, we have to also inform each other. So I'll just, um, I'll really just leave it at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Chanda? Yeah, I just have a, a really quick question response i'm um, which is to say that i'm um, we are often told that it is not possible to bridge that divide that my mom was just talking about um that you know if you're on one side of it or the other that you're doing one thing or another and you know since the theme here was generations i just really want to acknowledge i um, my mother is the person who taught me to think past the boundaries that were set up for me, um, that I was told that I could only be one thing one way. And my, my mother and, 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 and both of my grandmothers, but I particularly want to acknowledge my grandmother also, also because she can't be here, um, taught me to think past the borders that exist between us, that are erected between us and around us. So the idea that I couldn't be an ac ac academic and an organizer at the same time just never occurred to me. My understanding was that I was going to have to do both. And am I perfect at it? No, but I, I do feel that I'm doing it. And I hope that I'm setting some kind of example so that other people feel that there are other options available to them as well. Um, and that we can build a world where we are in good relations with each other. And just to go to the one question that I, I won't have time to answer, um, I think without that motivation from my mom, who first told me that we need a, we need people who are teaching us about the universe beyond the terrible things that are happening to us. This is one of the epigraphs of the book. I'm paraphrasing badly. Um, when we think about what it would take to ensure that every child has access to the experience of wandering over the night sky, it requires a radical re revision of how resources are distributed in our society, how power is distributed in our society. Um, it requires us to think about wages for housework and mass incarceration um, and how to end that and the end of colonialism. Um, and in some ways, as some people might say, the end of the world. So I, I really want to acknowledge, um, you know, my mom and, and Salma is two theorists who, who taught me to think beyond those traditional boundaries. Thank you so much. I'm going to give Salma the last word because I think she was coming in after Margaret spoke and then we will just bring this yes. incredible evening to a close. I, 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 do want, I do want to have one word. First of all, that what women do is to reverse the capitalist perspective 
which is profit. We say people, we say the natural world, and we follow that through with work that we do and that we are dedicated to, and that we want society to, um, to accept as its perspective. This is why we offer a care income, because we want the work of reproduction to be the central focus of the society. That's anti-capitalist. On the question of, um, of academia, I have to ask, you know, and, um, add Bonnie Lawrence defending and advertising the struggle of indigenous people. She has done a very good job and she writes brilliantly. And I, I do want to say that indigenous people everywhere are an important part of what needs to happen to save the planet because they've been there first in terms of what they do and how they begin with life. And they begin with the, um, with the support and care and protection of life. And that's what we all have to do in order to save the planet. And um, I wanted to say one final word about my son. He's done very well in the sense that he spent years fighting alongside other workers as a trade unionist, trying to fight against the constraints of the trade union, very similar to the academic constraints where you, um, you um, don't allow the grassroots to take the lead and to make the framework of your perspective and your struggle. And he's done that with us and for us. And I think that Chanda, you, you, you uh, did some, used to do physics with him, I think, and, the, and, the, and um, mathematics, two, two scientists together from time to time. Uh, I, I wanted to say that the, he had played a role certainly in my life and I think in all our lives and does fantastic work now. Thank you, Selma. Um, Chanda, Selma, Margaret, this has been remarkable. I think we're all truly humbled and grateful. And on a personal note, it was so amazing to meet you today, Chanda, Selma and Margaret. I am so grateful to be in continuous conversation and learning so much from you. I want to just close with two quotes before turning over to Kerry to bring it to a close. The first comes from Gail Lewis, who is actually on the call today and has put this note in the chat that I wanted to read to you. Hearing these stories from a family of activists, we have no clearer example of how our politics and activism has love at its core. Not just opposition, but generated from and generative of love, even as it exposes all the power relations and their manifestation in different sites, locations, formations. Thank you, Selma. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Chanda. And I want to close with a few sentences from Selma's Sex, Race and Class, her final chapter, Striving for Clarity and Influence, both of which were on such display today, an essay on the political legacy of CLR James 2001 to 2012. Politics, if it is fueled by a great will to change the world rather than by personal ambition, offers a chance to know the world and to be more self-conscious of the actual life you are living, rather than being taken over by what you are told you should feel about yourself and others. A chance, in other words, to live an authentic life. Such politics are a unique enrichment, not a sacrifice. 
for the example that all three of you have modeled today and Chanda as the daughter and granddaughter, the incredible sort of example that you have offered of how you have learned from Selma and Margaret and then Selma and Margaret talking about what they've learned from you has been a, a, a real inspiration to us. Um, thank you so, so much. And I will just turn it back over to Kerry. Selma, Margaret, um, Chanda, this has been a breathtaking, exhilarating conversation, uh, far beyond, I think, what we could ever have imagined or hoped for. I know I speak for everyone, um, uh, not only uh, um, uh, uh, in Toronto, but everyone in the, the wide world of the audience who is here today, and I know that because I am reading their comments, that they have found this conversation uh, needed, critical, uh, um, and as energizing and brilliant as we have. So uh, with the greatest, greatest, greatest of thanks, you have performed um, uh, the work of um, uh, unity, um, of family, of politics in, in, in the most extraordinary way. Um, uh, we're, we're out of words, <laughs> we're out of words. So uh, it remains for me to thank you once again and to thank also our tremendous uh, uh, technical supports, Natalia and Joe behind the scenes. And we would like to invite every single one of you to the next research seminar, which happens to take place one week from today. Um, at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it is a readathon honoring Bell Hooks, uh, uh, jointly convened with the Black Research Network. Uh, we hope many of you can join us, um, and we will um, honor and think of you uh, for many hours, many days, many weeks to come. Thank you again.